Hey everybody, Tim here. Uh, in this interview, I meet with Pastor Lonnie Harris, who's one of the pastors at 4C Bible Church in Silver Spring, Maryland. And this is actually the church that I grew up in. Um, it's in one of the most diverse counties in our country. And Pastor Lonnie, he helps us to ground our discussion on racial reconciliation in theology and a biblical worldview. Uh, what I love about this talk with Lonnie is his openness to share his own story with us, along with an encouragement for all of us to embrace each other's unique stories. Hello, we have Lonnie Harris here from Silver Spring, Maryland. And uh, welcome, Lonnie, it's so great to see you. Thank you, it's great to be with you. <laughs> and Lonnie, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, your role at your church. You are um, one of the pastors at 4C Bible Church there in Silver Spring. What yeah, kind of absolutely. Do you do? Yeah. I, I am 4C's uh, Tim Hanley. <laughs> 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 so I'm an associate pastor. Uh, I oversee missions. I oversee our benevolence ministry. I oversee um, like a, what we call like assimilation or uh, as, pe as new people come in and helping them get connected and get into onto the, the pathway of, you know, uh, plugging into the church and that kind of stuff. And so I, I preach probably, I don't know, five, six, seven times a year or so. Um, just depends, you know, and uh, teach classes and uh, kind of everything in between. So. <laughs> and 4C, uh, 4C Bible Church in Silver Spring, Maryland, very dear church to my own heart because mm -hmm. I was running around the hallways in diapers. So <laughs> at one point in time, that is not, not recently, but I grew up, <laughs> I grew up at Forest Sea Bible Church and, uh, and it is a very unique congregation. And over the last, you know, in my memory, it has changed a lot from when I was mm -hmm. a child up until now. What, what kind of, uh, how would you describe Forsey? Well, you know, I wasn't there uh, when you were young and stuff. I came probably, I guess it was in 2002, 2003. And um, so when I came, you know, I'm interracially married. And I, so I came in and one of the things that we were looking at right away is what is the, the, the racial component here? You know, not that it had to be one way or the other, but um, it's just something that you notice. Um, and we noticed there were probably like, five or six other, you know, interracially married couples. And it just felt like, wow, this is interesting. Uh, it still had the template, if you will, of what, you know, a lot of people might think of as the, like that typical evangelical white, you know, church. Um, and, you know, but we felt comfortable. We felt welcome. There's a lot of different people there. And, and what we found is over the years um, in the, in the I don't know, 18 years or so that I've been there at this point, that we have grown in diversity in terms of uh, like diversity, not just black and white, but very um, much a, an international feel, people from a lot of different countries um, coming. And so, and so it's, that's, you know, it, it's, you know, I guess you had asked, you know, what is the church like? You know, it's, it is a, a Bible church, uh, evangelical, um, Bible preaching church, and that's our our, our main value, um, is a, a missions minded, mission centered Bible teaching church, um, and uh, mm -hmm. with a lot and, of people from a lot of different backgrounds. So. Yeah, and you you even expressed, I think, when we were talking earlier, maybe how many ethnicities or oh yeah like cultural groups or yeah definitely it's really interesting I, I would say it fluctuates but every time we we count <laughs> which is like usually at our missions count uh, conference every every year uh it's somewhere between 40 and 50 or so different na nations represented in our church wow sometimes it's just one particular family sometimes it's multiple families but mm -hmm. it is um it's really beautiful uh to see that yeah, it's amazing. And it really reflects uh, the community from, you know, I mean, growing up in that area, Montgomery County being one of the more diverse counties mm -hmm. in uh, Forsey reflecting that diversity. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right, right in that congregation. And this is, you know, and this is obviously in our society, in our world, um, 
and even in our church, uh, you know, we've, there's a lot of tension uh, these mm -hmm. days, um, you know, along the lines of difference and um, even diversity. And I, mm -hmm. like one question that I think that we're all wondering is how or what does it look like to be unified in that kind of diversity? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question because it, and maybe it varies in church to church. You know, our church is probably, I think we have like 500 some family units. Um, and so some of those are single, some of those, you know, different sizes. And so um, with 50 to, you know, 40 to 50 different nationalities are, uh, represented, it, it can be a tricky thing, um, particularly when it still feels like we're probably. 35 to 40 percent minority and then the rest is uh white american uh or anglo-american i don't know what the right term is these days for how we describe ourselves it's so funny but it can be tricky and and i, I think yeah. um so i'll answer that question like maybe theoretically first and then just in practice what it looks like for us awesome on on the one sense you you know when you focus, it, this is it's tricky because when you focus um, and emphasize emphasize diversity, um, you it can lead to uh, a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God, where He's calling all nations, you know, every every language, every ethnic group, to come and worship Him, you know, in the unique ways that their culture and and ethnic, you know variations can provide and that that becomes a beautiful thing right um but if we're not careful that can also lead to a celebration of multiculturalism just for the sake of it like you see that in the world i, I was on a cruise once and they were just like we've got 70 nations here and they all came out and did the little flag dance and stuff and it was like okay but what what's the so what of that you know so we want to be careful not to just say hey we we have lots of different people and uh and, and we tolerate each other really well, <laughs> you know, that's, we need to go beyond that. So, mm -hmm. but in another sense, um, a focus and emphasis on diversity can lead to some unhealthy things as well. Um, it can lead to unhealthy, unhelpful consequences and, and ultimately lead to disunity. And you see mm -hmm. a lot of that in the world today as well. So mm -hmm. um, highlighting our differences can lead to, let me just elaborate, you know, highlighting our difference uh, can lead to elevating our differences. Mm -hmm. So they become a sort, sort of a, a source of pride. Um, and, and on the flip side of that, in, in the in the case of a minority, when you're highlighting differences, it can lead to an uncomfortable sense of isolation. Like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I'm the different one. <laughs> yeah, I'm the one that's got the, and, and I'm I'm in the spotlight, and I don't want to be in the spotlight. I just want to come in, you know. And so, mm -hmm. and, and that can lead to maybe an uncomfortable sense of isolation or shame or just a sense that I'm different and I don't belong here. So it's, mm -hmm. it can be tricky. Mm -hmm. um, I look at first Corinthians and Paul's talking about this in terms of uh, the factions. And so, you know, um, I won't actually go into it and read it, but there's, you know, different people like I'm, you know, uh, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, you know, you, you, you had uh, maybe even think of it in terms of political preference within the church, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and they were motivated, maybe sometimes by ethnicity of the person of the leader they followed. But my guess it was mainly personality and teaching style and stuff. And Paul says, "I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to agree together, to enter divisions, and to be united in the same mind and purpose." And then when he later on, and and this is First Corinthians one, um, uh, verse ten, and then later on in verse twenty one. Uh, he says, since in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased to save those who believe by the foolishness of preaching. And he, and then he talks about the two major ethnic groups, they divided themselves into Jews and everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. And so he says, the Jews demand miraculous signs and the Greeks or Gentiles ask for wisdom, but we preach about a crucified Christ. So this is a central message that unifies us a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, and in another place, he says, whether, you know, men, women, slave, free, no matter your ethnic group, right? We, to those who are called, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, uh, in practice for us, like what, what we realize is that, you know, when we see our ethnicity and our diversity, we need to, um, we don't want to ignore it. Uh, we celebrate it um, and we embrace it, uh, but it's for his glory. Um, it's not something that we've tried to create. It's something that God is doing and we've recognized and we're like, this is really cool. Let's, let's embrace this and give God glory. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm a little long winded here, but no, yeah. this is great. No, this is, I think it's really important because we're, we are yeah. going through Ephesians right now. Okay, perfect. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of parallels. I, I mean, you know, we see even in chapter one, this fact that in Christ, all things are being, you know, brought together or unified. Mm -hmm. But the, the focus is that that's happening, not arbitrarily, or, you know, without a foundation or without grounding, or just to, you right. know, in a, in a Babel sense where we're mm -hmm. showing that we are great, you know, but it's in the person of Jesus. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a, you know, if we lose that focus, then we've lost a lot when it comes right. to unification or un unifying diversity. Right. Um, but yeah, that, you know, at the same time, it like, so what that does is when you build on that foundation, there's particular practical things that we do and, and that we're still in the middle of, and it's a work in progress. So like we years ago, we had a multicultural committee where uh, we asked different questions of people from different uh, nationalities, like, you know, um, just like, let us learn what's your story, what draw you drew you to the church, you know, what, like, what's working, what's not working, you know, what should we do? What should we not like just trying to be intentional. Um, and we got a lot of good uh, feedback there. And, um, and one of the big things we learned is don't emphasize this okay there's us and then there's you the multicultural ones the ethnic ones you know it's like no we're a family they they want to just be they don't want to be ignored they want to be celebrated but not over and against everybody else like in this so we saw that we also um we we uh we have flags from all the nations that are represented uh displayed in the sanctuary and that seems to be something that um that people appreciate and there's also a sense um, where when you they see somebody from the stage who who's leading in prayer, who has an accent, who's a you know, uh, or who's like them, you know, or we we you know we're singing, we're worshiping, and we have some uh, a, a line in one of the songs that's done in Spanish, or um, uh, you know, it, we've done probably four or five different languages, um, and we explain it to everyone, and we try to do it in a style that is authentic as much as possible. Uh, that's appreciated because it feels like home. Like, yeah, that's the way we do it, and it, and it's like, mm -hmm. and it's like, when you have something that you love, like my favorite dish that my family makes, <laughs> I want to share it with everybody. I want you to uh, appreciate it the way I do, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's how how yeah. it, it we we try to celebrate that. Yeah, there's a, a there's an absolute, uh, you know, when you're you're in a place of diversity, I imagine, you know, for Forsy, like when you're experiencing this, like as an Anglo myself, experiencing mm -hmm. something like this, it draws me into a greater and a broader and a fuller experience of who God is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a yeah. theological component to this that I, I think often we, um, to some degree, sometimes maybe we um, can set aside, you know. And so there's a there's a purpose and a, and a, a reason theologically to yes. dive into diver diversity. Yeah, I yeah. mean, God is unity. He's one and he's diverse and he's creative. Like, exactly. You know, yeah. we, and, and so we that's why we have to embrace it, because if we I don't want I don't want somebody to say, well, I just ignore skin color. I just ignore ethnicity. Like, I, I, a common phrase I hear is, I'm, yeah. you know, the, the goal is to be colorblind or to not right. to not to think that everyone is the same. Yeah, and I understand the sentiment yeah. of that. Like, I don't want to prejudge you. I want to give you a a, a shot in the same way I would any. But I, I get that. But mm -hmm. but if there's a sense in which no, I want you to see my my color. I want you to see my ethnicity. But I want you to see it in the light of God's creativity and His glory, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's something to be embraced as along with yours. You know, and exactly. together, yeah, yeah. So it's it's beautiful. That is beautiful. Um, and so. Lonnie, we were talking uh, earlier about how you uh, had, uh, you grew up in a white neighborhood, a white community. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I think we'd love to learn, like, what was that like for you to grow up kind of in a more homogenous, homogenous neighborhood or, or environment, yeah. and yet being the minority or being, you know, kind of mm -hmm. the standout in that regard, or yeah, whatever absolutely. you would call it. I don't know what word you would use. But. Yeah, no, just, yeah, feeling like a minority and, and, and uh, because you, you are in that neighborhood and you're made very aware of it. You know, I, um, I, I had family and friends in uh, a black neighborhood that I spent most of my time in during the summers, uh, at my grandmother's house. And then during the school year, I'd come back to Pasadena, Maryland, where we live. And, um, and that was a, a predominantly white neighborhood, predominantly white uh, school. Uh, my dad got saved when I was young. Um, and so he just went to the church of the person who led him to the Lord, which was a predominantly white church. And so it was, you were very aware. Um, like when I was very young, we moved to, um, uh, like I said, Pasadena, which I, I had come to learn at some point that at that time, it was like Ku Klux Klan territory. Oh, wow. Uh, and that was its past, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and my the dad told me a story at, at some point when I was older that like, you know, the first time he uh, uh, went to the, like the little corner store, he walked in and you know, they, they looked at him and, you know, used the N word and told him, you know, we don't sell watermelon sandwiches here, you know, get out of here. He was so angry, you know, he went went home and he was about to do something violent. And he, <laughs> this was before he was saved. And my mother stopped him and it's like, no, it's not worth it. You know, so I'm like, that's the, that was the neighborhood we, we lived in. And it's interesting because I didn't experience that that kind of stuff personally, uh, mostly. Um, so I'm just this kid living in this neighborhood trying to, to fit in. I had developed friendships and stuff like that. I didn't experience police harassment or brutality. I didn't experience institutional racism or anything like that. Um, my experience was more uh, about dealing with individual racism that this person over here has or that person has or mainly insensitivities that like even my own friends had. Mm -hmm. So let me explain that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we, I, we were talking about like uh, hair is a big deal, right? Um, and in different cultures and how we treat our hair. So, you know, I grew up, you know, and to treat black hair the way that um, it needs to be treated, you, you have to put oils in it, grease, hair grease, you know, and um, uh, because it dries out and it's unhealthy to, for it to dry out that way. Um, and, and so my friends were like, you know, white friends were like, why would you put grease in your hair? You know, and they would laugh and they think that's funny. And I'm, and here that leaves me feeling like, oh, I'm different. Maybe I'm not supposed to do that. What's wrong with me? You know, you know I'm just a kid trying to figure this out. Um, uh, or why do you even mess with your hair? You don't have any hair to brush, you know, because my hair is not, you know, six or seven or eight inches long or whatever. Um, uh, or stuff like, um, you know, why, you know, it just, it's a whole range of little comments that you get where these are my friends and they're not trying to be mean, they're just being funny, you know, but not realizing the, the effect that it would have on me. It's um, like highlighting that, you know, maybe in their eyes something, or maybe you, you even uh, came to, came away from those moments and correct me if I'm wrong, like mm -hmm. feeling like you were unusual or yes. Like you they're normal and I'm belong. different. Yeah, so they're, <laughs> yep. they're normal and you're different. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I've even I even had people say, well, you're you're not like the other ones, as if that's supposed to be a compliment, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, I've experienced not being served at a restaurant or being harassed by uh, like everywhere you go, you always know that, you know, you're different. And so that has a psychological effect at, at some point. Um, you know, I'm always aware of my complexion, always aware that, you know, in the school that I'm in or in the, the church that I'm in, I, you know, I know that, yes, my family's the only black family or I'm the only black one in this class, so that kind of a thing. And it does something to you when people are talking about their heritage and their history and, you know, and you feel sort of ashamed. You know, oh, my ancestors were slaves and yay, let's celebrate that. You know, I feel, and not being taught African-American history and understanding that there are a lot of things to celebrate there within the church and, you know, just in secular society. And um, that's damaging. So you, it, it left me feeling inferior, left me, I, I learned how to code switch early on, code switching is something Tell that people, that, yeah. yeah. So um, 
when I talk, you know, I, I think I've developed a way of talking that's just now the way I talk and I try to, it just, but, but when I was little, especially, I was very conscious of how I would sound. So, you know, when I'm around my family and, and my black family and friends, I, I talk like my black family and friends and that was natural to me. But then I learned to talk like my white friends and family, uh, white friends and church family and uh, to fit in and learn to do it without even thinking about it. And I remember even, you know, talking to myself and like trying to figure out what's the better way to say this, you know, just really weird stuff like that. And so, but what, what happens is, you know, you, you start to, for me, that made me, you know, feel at one point, I remember as a teenager feeling, who am I and how do I even sound that just naturally anymore? Like losing yeah. yourself and your yeah. identity. It's a loss. Yeah. Loss of identity. And, you know, like, yep. who am I? What is my self-concept in yep. relation, yep. you know, to, to the way that I look in relation to others, but even just in relationship to like the, what does it mean to participate in a community? Exactly. And then yeah. you feel like you're not accepted by anybody, by my yeah. black friends, because I know how to navigate in the white world. And, and, uh, and if they see me, they're like, oh, who are you? Are you, you know, and in order of my, my white friends, like, oh, even though you're black on the outside, you're really white on the inside, you know, and it, that whole Oreo cookie thing. Yeah. And they don't even know that I'm just trying to fit in with you. Yeah, and that, that, is a, <laughs> so it's, that is a lonely place to be. It really is. It's crazy. Yeah. So how, what has it looked like to navigate that kind of loneliness? I think it, for, for much of my, you know, childhood life that, you know, kids are mean, like it doesn't matter about race. We will find something to make fun of you about regardless, you know? And so, but, but then interpreting that through a grid of, of race and stuff, like it, it really was difficult and, um, and I was ashamed. Um, so, but then at some point later in my, um, in, in my high school years, I began to really embrace this black pride thing, you know, and um, I had my Malcolm X hat and, you know, I had, you know, and I was more deliberate about hanging out with my black friends, the few black friends that I had in the white school and very deliberate about letting people know that I am black and black is beautiful. And in, the, in you know, the music that we, you know, I listened to and the way that I carried myself. Um, and, uh, but that there's a whole thing in, in black culture, if you, what does it mean to be black, you know? And uh, how does that come out um, in the way that you respond to others? Because I'm, I'm a child of God first, right? And so there are aspects of all of our cultures and subcultures that might be uh, acceptable in the kingdom. And uh, there are other aspects that are not acceptable in the kingdom and however you attach that to your culture or not. So, um, so I, I had to work through that and learning um, that, no, don't act like you're, you know, the being, being a gangster from the hood is not uh, inherently black. That's a lie. That's a myth that culture is telling you. So don't try to be like that, especially because that's not who you are and that's not where you, you come from. Uh, and so, um, so that was a whole interesting development as well. Yeah, um, I think this is really important, you know, for us to hear, especially people that have gr grown up in more white or homogenous mm -hmm. uh, neighborhoods. Um, you know, and, and even for me who grew up in uh, honestly a predominantly black neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, I still, I did not feel that same tension hmm. that you felt growing up. Hmm. Um, obviously there's, uh, you know, there's ways in which uh, pressures and things like that happen, as you said, like kids are mean. And yet I think there's something about, you know, in, in a way like this idea of, um, you know, what is normal and like, in a mm -hmm. way, like I was, I was the normal one, you know? Right. And so right. I didn't have to blend in. I was kind of, you know, I guess whatever you call it, dominant culture or whatever, like I, I fit that normal or that dominant kind of, um, uh, like this is, you know, what it means to be normal in our society. Yeah. And, uh, and I, think, I think it's important for us maybe to even wonder like what actually is normal, you know, because right. oftentimes uh, we can push out other people inadvertently mm -hmm. and sometimes intentionally um, 
when we when we kind of create this kind of you know normal uh, environment and and what i'm thinking of especially is like within the church yeah like what yeah. does it mean to be normal within our church environment and right just some things to talk about. and we could talk for hours probably about this but let me ask like as you um had processed through uh you know th these challenges uh, growing mm -hmm. up and then later uh as a young adult like what has and i imagine this is a process like what has healing looked like in your life you know with yeah. these specific kinds of hurts and pains and loneliness and things yeah like that. so I, i'll t i'll use the term healing in terms of like dealing with the wounds that i had realizing that i had wounds first of all because <laughs> i'm an easygoing person i let a lot of things just roll off my back and just sweep it under a rug and never deal with it so realizing that i had wounds but then but but not just um the healing from the wounds, but also learning and growing in terms of like, what's the right way to think about this kind of stuff? So I'll, I'll use healing to refer to both of those. But first, just realizing over time that my health and wholeness as a person can't depend on this person over here or that person over there. It can't depend on society fixing problems caused by sin, ultimately. Um, it doesn't depend on white people everywhere putting up Black Lives Matter signs. That does nothing for me. You know, I, I don't even agree with Black Lives Matter, you know, as a, a political group. Every life matters. You know, that's how I would, would see it. Uh, and and for, for a white person to say, oh, no, that's that's inappropriate. You can't say all lives matter. I think that's garbage, right? Because um, all lives do matter. And I do think it's important when someone who is being particularly uh, victimized and particularly hurting, I think it's appropriate to say, you know what, your life matters, you know, and to single them out. But this movement has nothing, anyway, I don't want to get, get into that. But I, I, the point is that I don't think that my healing doesn't depend on white people putting up signs in their yard saying, um, Black people are okay with me, you know. Oh, good. You know, the, the, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know who you are, and you don't know who I am. Um, I think it so it doesn't depend on people who have wronged me coming to apologize and ask for forgiveness because they might not be sorry, they might be wicked, they might not want, they might uh, justify their sin against me. So my health can't depend on them making it right with me. Um, it does nothing for me if the ancestors of people who have wronged my ancestors, um, um, you know, uh, uh, or, or the, the ancestors of people, yeah, yeah, who have wronged my ancestors come to me and apologize for what their ancestors did to my ancestors. That doesn't do anything for me. I'm like, oh, well, if you feel the need to do that, then I, I hear you, you know. But I, I came to realize that really my wholeness depends on understanding who I am in Christ and what my mission is in Christ. And to learn how to, to not be a victim, don't act like a victim when Christ says I'm a victor. I had to go to the word of God. And so, um, you know, like one impact that this whole thing has had on my, my psyche is like this, this victim mentality. And I had to realize, I didn't realize how much I had bought into that, um, you know, so, a victim mentality is rooted in a, um, an identity as one who's oppressed and victimized. I'm the oppressed one. I'm the victimized one. I'm the one who everything is against me because I'm black, you know, and everything then is seen through that grid. And I, I think that that's wrong. Um, all, you know, a victim mentality is rooted in this idea that all my obstacles are re a result of my oppression and, and my race. Uh, my victim status creates limitations that and my thinking are impossible to overcome. Um, so I have this ceiling over my head and, and, and then other people reinforce that with their low expectations because, oh, well, you're just a black male, you know? And, and so uh, because I'm a victim, nothing bad that happens to me is my fault, right? I don't have to take personal responsibility. Because I'm a victim, I'm dependent on others, often the oppressors to fix my problems and get my freedom. You know, or as a victim, I'm not accountable for, but rather justified in my negative reactions to my uh, negative circumstances or someone else's sin against me. That's all of that is garbage. It's unbiblical. So I'm a believer in Christ first. And, and when I embrace that, 
I think I started to, to look at a lot of scriptures, a lot of scripture that deals with our identity as followers of Jesus. Um, one that makes us sons of the living God, sons and daughters of the living God, the fullness of his power. I'm not a victim. How dare I, you say you're a victim? You're a child of God, you know? You are princes and princesses and queens. And, and so uh, scriptures that deal with God's character, like his justice, because you do have to come to terms with injustice, right? So having to understand the problem of evil, why would God allow slavery and oppression? Why does he allow society to be the way it is? Um, dealing with scriptures that, that talk about forgiveness and love of enemies, you know, this is the gospel, right? You know, like, so I'm victimized. Guess what? Christ is victimized. Guess what? God loved us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. How can you as a believer lay down your life for this person who is oppressing you, or, you know, and mm -hmm. I, like, I can do that because I'm a victor in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all of that I could go on and on, yeah. but um, just working through that, those mm -hmm. kinds of things, looking at the particular scriptures that deal with those themes has been really helpful for me. Yeah. And it, it sounds like being able to take personal responsibility and not placing it on the shoulders of other people mm -hmm. to open that door for you where Jesus has already opened that door. Yep. Yep. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep, absolutely. With that, with that being said, um, would you think that there are, you know, responsibilities for people like me, you know, I mean, maybe white people or whatever, maybe like, are there things that we should know that would help us in the journey towards racial reconciliation? Um, because, uh, you know, I think for some of it, I mean, for, for some of my friends and um, colleagues, I, I recognize maybe the tendency to think that, um, you know, that's not really in my hands, like that was done in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, it's no longer a problem, you know, um, so I don't have any, any role or responsibility uh, in that. Um, yeah. What would you say about that? I, I think a lot of, I think there are things that, yes, you should know. There's things that we all should know, really. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way that that works best is when we get together and have these kinds of conversations. You tell me your story. I tell you my story. Absolutely. You, you, we have safe environments where you can say, yeah, honestly, hey, I love you in Christ. I'm your brother in Christ. But I'm, I have an honest question. Like, I don't feel responsible for what they did back then. And it makes me feel uncomfortable. Like, what are we supposed to do about that? And I'm loving you and I answer that question the best I can. And we talk because we, we come to, I think those intentional kinds of conversations are very helpful. Mm -hmm. But for me to then just like go out and tell white people, hey, you need to do this or you need to not do that. I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, but I, I do think, you know, you say some things that maybe you should know that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. One is that my experience is my experience. It's not every black person's experience. Just like, um, like, what would you think if I said something about white culture? Like, what's white culture? You know, what what's people like the variations and the people who you know, like that doesn't make any even make I, any sense. Right? I think most of us don't even know that we are <laughs> white culture, which is maybe one of the things. <laughs> maybe that's one of the things we can learn is what is my culture? <laughs> yeah, you know, like but when I you agree start with to. You. Think, to like, generalize yeah generalizing yeah. is not helpful yeah because it's like let, let me just find out what you know it may be that you there, i've met white people who strongly identify with italian american like oh yeah my grandmother was italian she came over and and we have this meal and this dish but there's some people who are like you know uh, I never heard of that. Or some other person who like haggis, what's haggis? <laughs> never heard of haggis. So like white culture is diverse, just like black culture is, you know? Mm -hmm. And so every person has their own experiences and their own story. And I think what's helpful is just learning each other's stories and learning to embrace each other. Mm -hmm. um, and this is I, a way to even move towards racial reconciliation. I, yep, to absolutely. Know each other. Yep. yep, to know each other and, and not just tolerate each other, but truly embrace each other. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like white people shouldn't have to, and, and nobody should have to walk on eggshells of political correctness, you know? Um, you shouldn't be, love is kind, right? So yes, if you make a racial joke that's politically incorrect, it's sin, not because it's politically incorrect, but because 
when you said that, it was unkind and it was very hurtful to the person that was standing next to you. Love is, is kind, right? Mm -hmm. so who cares about political correctness? Let's be, kind, let's be uh, above, re beyond reproach, right? And uh, mm -hmm. uh, Black people shouldn't make every offense about race because it's not. And every, everyone should examine their own hearts and be eager to repent and apologize and eager to forgive. But, but yeah, I, I think we need to, to connect uh, as churches, you know, and uh, as it's, you know, maybe white churches and black churches coming together to, uh, you know, and this gets to the reconciliation question mm -hmm. to, to talk about these types of things. Yeah. 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 Thank you. No, I mean, yeah, this absolutely. is really important. And I, I think for us in Longmont, one of the challenges maybe that I recognize is, uh, is we could live our lives very easily and very comfortably not recognizing that 20 to 25% of our local community is Spanish speaking families. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and yet, and this is a question maybe for us, you know, in, in my congregation, like how, how can we like embrace and know, know people, even within our church, mm -hmm. even within our own church, how can we take those steps to, to become aware of, of other people's experiences? Yeah. So Lonnie, thank you so much. I feel like, 4C Bible Church is exemplary in the way that you, you live out. I mean, for one, reflecting the community um, that you are a part of uh, right there in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, you know, the fact that you are working towards unity in the midst of such diversity, but focused and grounded in Jesus um, as the unifier. Um, and then thank you for sharing your personal story with us. I mean, that's valuable. I mean, just knowing knowing you and yeah. recognizing your journey and also and also some of your encouragement so i just want to thank you so much on behalf of calvary church here in longmont thank yeah, you absolutely. is there anything else thank you'd you. like to leave us with or no i just really appreciate this the opportunity i think we just this is this is it we do more of this together um and share it with our churches you know you might be in a, a neighborhood where you like again don't have a lot of diversity in your church, but maybe, you know, in as much as there's a black church down the street or a Spanish church down the street, mm -hmm. let the leaders come together and be intentional about, hey, let's get our people talking because we serve the same Jesus and uh, let's do some things together intentionally to create environments where we can show the world unity. Yeah, and, and, and in that demonstrating the grace and allowance and forgiveness, you know, I mean, even when yeah. we were talking last week or two weeks ago, kind of preparing for this conversation, I was like, um, I don't know how to phrase this question that I'm going to ask. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> exactly. Is that how you want me to say it? You know? Yeah. Be, we're, so. You're safe. You can say I'm unoffendable, right? <laughs> you can say anything. I know your heart, you know? So, yeah. Absolutely. So, so thank you, Lonnie. Uh, you're, you're, uh, yeah, you're a blessing to us. Oh, thank well, you thank so much. You. For I appreciate time. this opportunity, Tim. Yeah. God bless. All right. Take care.